right, welcome to Fall City. Go ahead and stand. that you are joining us this morning and welcome to everyone on Facebook Live. If you're joining with us, please like, share, get the word out and you can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram and our website, fallcitychristian.com. Um, again, a reminder, we are offering financial peace for free to anyone that is interested. Um, for more information, please um, see Quentin. Quentin's in the back right there. If you're interested in taking financial peace, um, please talk to him about it. Um, obviously, with COVID going on, um, offering and communion, just go back there to the back, take it at your own time, put the offering in at your own time, just whenever you feel moved or comfortable to do that. If you are new to Fall City, please leave us a message so that we can reach out to you. Um, there should be a little piece you can tear off of the flyer you got where you can fill out information. Put that in the back so that we can get in contact with you. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, and lastly, in these um, troubling times, um, we just want you guys to reach out. Like, if you know someone that needs something, um, or if you need something, please do not hesitate to get a hold of Tim or Quentin or Adam. Or if you know someone that is in need of something, please, um, we want to do more than just come here every Sunday and, you know, worship with each other. We want to reach out to the community and be the church. Um, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, uh, go ahead with our worship.
You guys can have a seat. So I want you to imagine the weight of the room. Whenever all the disciples are in this upper room and Jesus, um, he slides this bowl of, of wine across the table and he says, uh, take part in this because this is my blood that will be shed for you. And, and, he, and he breaks this bread and he says, he says, take eat for this is my body that would be given up for you, that would be sacrificed for you, right? Imagine being one of those, one of those 12 guys and thinking, what the heck is going on? Like, things have been pretty good for three years. Why is he dropping this on us now? It's the Passover celebration. We're supposed to be partying. Things are supposed to be uh, on the upswing, and then you drop this on us? But then by the end of the dinner, I mean, he has washed their feet. He has spent time with them. He's reclined at the table with them. He's told them what's about to happen. By the end of the dinner, can you imagine the anticipation? Maybe in some cases, the anxiety that comes with, I wonder what's happening next. I wonder what he's up to. Because in a lot of times, we look at, at seasons like we're in now as a, as a, as a world, as, as a nation, and we think, why? That's the question that we ask, why? But the thing about it is, is when, when Jesus is in the room, when he's at the table, we don't have to ask why. We get to ask, what are you up to? Like, like what's that next step? And all of a sudden, it switches from confusion it switches from, from, from a moment of, of fighting to understand to, to now a moment of, of anxious excitement, right? And so as a church, every week we partake in this thing called the Lord's Supper. And, and essentially what it is, as Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so today in this moment with everything that's going on, is our, our eyeball to eyeball time with Jesus. And my challenge is, as we do this, we think about the, the price that was paid for us. We, we celebrate the life that was bought for us. But why don't we go ahead and approach it with, with, a, with a mindset of, of excitement? Not asking why. We know why. Because we couldn't do it on our own, Right? But now we get to ask, okay, what are you up to? What are you doing? Well, what, is, what is this next step that we're going to take that's going to kind of up the ante here? And this, this moment is a, is a moment that we take out of every week where we can just kind of quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, not, not deal with the distractions around us, and we can focus solely on Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and what he's up to. Father, we thank you so much for this day of life you've given us. We thank you for, um, for the fact that we know you're not done. That we know whenever, whenever things are going kind of a bit crazy, we know you don't waste that. You don't waste a thing. And so as we partake, let us clear our minds. Let us clear our hearts. Let us come to the table with an excitement about what you're up to. It's in the name of Jesus, I ask and pray. Amen.
for who you are, and I thank you that in these times of chaos and unrest that you just provide a peace that passes all understanding, and I just thank you that you are for us, that you are always for us, and you're always with us, and I just thank you so much that you care so much about us that you would send your only son so that we might just have a chance of everlasting life. And I just thank you for this church and for this community and what you're doing in Madison. And I just ask that you would be with Tim as he brings your message. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And hey, what a great reminder that everything is going to be all right. <laughs> right? I mean, he has plans for um, our families and for their children and their children 
and their children. And so we're watching the ebbs and flow of life and humanity and selfishness and, and even goodness play throughout all of this, um, which, which brought me to a thought, uh, I guess it's been a, a few weeks ago, that we needed to address some of the things going on in our society, in our culture, in our nation, in our world, and just in, in general um, involving humankind. And so I came up with this, this, this thought of uh, a whole bird, which is weird because I don't know whether I, I really want to look at it as like a, a completely naked turkey getting ready for Thanksgiving or whether it's just a, a full like feathered bird in all of its glory flying. So, but either way, either way, um, I wanted to think about uh, the whole bird. And last week um, we, we talked about uh, just in general, the, the polarity, the polarization. Is that the, pro- the proper word? Or am, I, or am I like talking about sunglasses now? I don't know. I, it messes with me. But um, just the polarity of the world and how um, we tend to fall on one, sh- one extreme or the other and we leave uh, very little grace and very little room for what's kind of in between there. And uh, the challenge was uh, for us to not be a one-winged bird because a one-winged bird um, doesn't go anywhere. And if it gets off the ground, it typically flies in circles. And we know that birds that fly in circles are looking for stuff that's already dead. So um, I wanted to kind of preface this sermon with that so you guys could know where I'm coming from because I have thoughts, I have opinions, I I think like I do, I'm uh, irreverent, inappropriate a lot of times. Um, I I take, I I try and take things seriously, but for some reason, my idiocy slips out most of the time. Um, But I wanted you guys to know that that I I felt it uh, a necessity for me to challenge the church to, to think a little bit right, to uh, consider a little bit, to not be so extreme on one side, not just do what you've been told, but like think about that. And so we talked a little bit about the importance of of conversation and, and bringing the both and to the table as opposed to just the either or. And so today is a little bit of the same, just with a different flavor. Um, and this flavor, I'm, I'm not going to lie, um, it makes me nervous. Um, a pa- as a pastor, I've always understood that you uh, probably shouldn't preach about politics because it just pisses people off, you know, um, honestly. And for the most part, I agree. Like, I agree. People are so passionate about it. I'm cool with politics being like an individual thing. I'm cool with people kind of processing through their own morals and their own values and their loyalties to tradition and also their loyalties to progress until until it becomes so divisive that little can be said without offending somebody, right? Right? And, 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 then, and then the problem is, we're, then we're trapped. We're trapped by lingo and agendas and, and a, a, a never-ending power struggle of a two-party system that would be happy to jerk the rug out from the other one at any given chance, right? And, and so whenever it becomes that, then there's a problem. As a parent, this is hard to watch unfold to think about the future and those promises of God for, for my children and their children and their children. And I think a, a lot about how my kids are, are going to make an impact on the world. And I've, I've done a lot of discussing and directing in manners of, of inclusivity or inclusiveness or uh, just including people um, about caring, about kindness, about justice, and about love. And sometimes I wonder if it's all for nothing right? But it seems like, like the influence that the social climate of the world they live in today says none of that works. Justice doesn't work. Love doesn't work. Inclusivity doesn't work. So, so let's just be name callers and be combative instead uh, because that's an easier way to be, to be heard. 
And so now we as the church have to, have to begin to have these hard conversations that we don't typically have in church. Conversations like, like politics and racism and, and just not being a jerk, right? And so we have to have these, these hard conversations about the, the contrast between how we paint the world to our kids, but how they're actually seeing it. Because it feels like something's off. I believe that, that, we've got, that we've become so polarized as a nation that the future generations are already learning how to, how to posture themselves politically. They're learning how to debate and battle and, and, and war and they're learning politics and, and they're doing that because that is the, the, the nature of things right now and I don't believe that it's right. And there are a few things that I've, that I've noticed recently that alarm me. And maybe that's a good thing that we're going through everything we're going through now because up until then, it wasn't alarming. But now it is because it's all in your freaking face, right? All of it, all the time. So, so I'd like to begin a conversation, all right? Not a sermon, not me yelling my side of things at anybody, just simply a, a conversation. in a way that's going to be productive and good, hopefully. That's been my prayer for this past week, that this message is productive and good. So, here we go. <laughs> my first point, the first thing that, that kind of alarms me, the first thing that I want to warn the people that I love so much about is wing worship. <laughs> I know that sounds super weird, but... Um, Wing worship. Now, what, what's wing worship, right? I couldn't find a definition in Webster's Dictionary for some reason. I don't know why. Probably because I just freaking made it up. Anyways, I don't think there's a definition, uh, but this is what I've noticed, all right? There's, there's, there are people out there who have jumped on a side, and, and they act as though they are convinced that the side that they are on, be it left or right, okay, is the sum and total of what we as a people should be in order to be real people. Like they're the end all be all. I'm not saying that's what they believe. I'm just simply saying that they behave as though they believe this way. All right? That, that, that their party is going to be the savior of all things. The, the, and the reason that this is dangerous is because there is not a single party, a single person or group that has it all figured out. There's not. Jesus, that's the Sunday school answer and really the answer to everything. But other than that, I mean, we even have churches that are still fighting over doctrine. So tell me if we even have it all figured out. We know the Jesus part, but then it gets a little muddy after that, doesn't it? And so there's not a single, a single group that has it all figured out. The complexities of, of humanity are just too vast to have it all figured out. There's too many layers, right? And, and for someone to simply adopt everything that a single party stands for or leverages, I believe is irresponsible. I believe it's lazy too that you just let somebody do all your thinking for you. I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't think that we ever should have been like that. Our faith is supposed to be our own, so don't just listen to what I have to say. Check it against the Bible. Check it against your, your peers. Check it against real pastors. I don't know. <laughs> but but, the, but the, the willingness to be, to be owned by a set of beliefs that are contradictory, normally, right? And normally used as tools by politicians for the sake of their power and their pension. Those are the two big ones, right? It, 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 it feeds a beast that has led us to the, to the thing that we're contending with today, right? The sadness that we see or hear or worry about today. 
It kind of feeds that beast. And, and you can't turn on the TV without having your ear bent. And the sad thing is that most of the time, whenever you hear something on TV about, the, about politics, it's an ad about how the other side sucks. And they don't really say anything other than how the other side sucks as opposed to what the solution to any of these problems actually are. And solutions are important when we have this many problems. As, and, and we as people, we just, we just kind of just kind of buy in, don't we? The room's heavy. Some of y'all asleep, some of y'all hating, some of y'all I don't know yet. I'm still trying to figure you out. But, but we just kind of buy in. We allow our well-being to be dictated by these, these political parties who are out for one thing, to win. Like, that's what they want. That's what they're doing. They want to win. But, but what is the win? Like, what is the win that we are declaring like, how do you know if we've accomplished the win? Is it simply the majority? Oh, the majority says so. So that's the win? Well, mm, is the majority always right? Mm, is not. As a matter of fact, the majority being right as opposed to wrong or indifferent in some situations is typically the exception and not the rule. It's typically the exception, not the rule. I, I want you to, to, to check this, this little Bible story, okay? I, I love this Bible story. Um, you guys probably had it on the, on the flannel board uh, whenever you were in Sunday school. Some old lady with really, really thick glasses and white or blue hair, depending on how old she was, um, would, uh, would plop it up there. If she was super crafty, there were popsicle sticks involved, okay? Um, it's simply about, about not allowing yourself to just be told what to do. To think about it. To act upon how you think about it. So let's check this out. It's, uh, it, it's a story you guys know of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or as um, the great theologians, the Veggie Tales call them. Uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Right? <laughs> so it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue. This statue was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And... Um, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Okay, Babylon, at this point in time, they were studs. They kicked butt. They took names. They kicked names. They took butt. They did whatever they want because they were, they were Babylon, right? All right. Then he sent messages um, to the high officers, so all the politicians, all right, all the different branches of, of politicians, um, to the high officers, the officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial uh, officers to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. All right, so the king builds a 90-foot statue. It's nine foot wide, and he commands everybody, the big dogs and little dogs alike, to come and 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 celebrate the dedication of this, all right? So far, no big deal. Cool, building cool things, celebrating it. Might be wine, could get crazy, I don't know, right? Anyways, um, so all the officials came and they, they stood before the statue um, King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, then a herald shouted out, uh, he, that was his job, that wasn't his name. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine if your job was a herald and your name was Harold? You have two of the same names. I'm Harold Harold. It sounds like a really jacked up NASCAR driver. Anyways, anyways, then Her then Harold or no, then a Harold shouted out, "People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command." The king has spoken, right? And, and when you hear the sound of the, the horn, the flute, the, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipes, and I, sometimes that could be alarming if you hear the sound of pipes because then your toilet's about to explode or something. Anyways, pipes and other musical instruments, uh, this is the part where it gets stupid. Bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. When you hear the music playing, get your face in the dirt because of what the king has built. 
Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or, or nation or language, they just bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They just did it. But some of the astrologers, those are the, the nerds of their time, I think. Some of the astrologers uh, went to the king and in, informed um, on the Jews. And so there are these three guys. We're not going to go all the way through that. Uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny, they refused. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. Because everybody else just did what they were told. He said, I built this statue. This is my symbol for winning. Get your face in the dirt. Bow before it, right? So let's unpack this scene here. King Nebuchadnezzar has built a statue, which is pretty cool. I mean, a 90-foot statue is pretty impressive. And it was made out of gold. I love gold. Anybody know what that's from? <laughs> Shape me for myself. Anyways, um, and it's, it's huge. Uh, he, he's, able to, he's able to show off his wealth. He's able to show off his, his power. And this gold has probably been, it's probably come from plunder from battles because the Babylonians were great warriors and they took over a lot of nations and ran through a lot of cities, right? It was from plunder of battles past or, or maybe taxation of the present people of his community. Either way, he had a lot of gold, right? And this guy says, look at what I've built. Look, look at what I've done. Look what I can do. So I'm, just, I'm just on it with all these old school, culturally, uh, used to be culturally relevant things. Anyways, he says, not only look at what I've done, but get down on the ground and worship it. Like marvel at what I've built. For no other reason than because I said so. This, this king with, with no regard for the people of his kingdom, right? He's collected, taxed, charged, and probably even lobbied for money to build this statue with one purpose, just to say, I win. I win. Like the win is just to be able to declare that you win. And because of it, we now have an entire nation of people who just worship a winner just because he won, just because he happened to be the king, right? A winner who stands for nothing but himself and makes sure that everybody else bows down before him, right? A winner who is now being celebrated at the expense of human lives. If you don't bow, you get thrown into the furnace. A winner who is, who's pretending or who has pretended that he's, that he's all about the people with promises of, of safety because they are, are one of the greatest military kingdoms in all of history, right? They could really kick some butt. So, so you're safe because of the battles we won. They were crazy good fighters. But now, after all that safety and after I've kind of pitched that to you, bow to my idol or else. But ultimately, they just worshipped the winner, right? Because that's what they had to do and that's all they knew. Today, a lot, of, a lot of us simply do this. We just worship the winner. They, 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 they side with the team that they think's going to win. They hedge their, their, their bets on being one of the winners. And then when they win, it becomes fairly obvious that the winner was just all about winning. I think we've kind of replaced sports with politics right now. You want to know how I know? They've got like the cardboard stand-ups at all the sporting events right now. And that's, that's really what it looks like whenever you see Congress, right? They're all just, nobody's raising their hands, nobody's, right? It's some of them, you want to check their pulse, right? Have, have, you, have you ever met uh, one of those people? I say one of those people. That sounds like I'm a jerk, right? But, but hear me out here because it's one of those people. One of those people who is like their, the well-being of their life is dependent on whether their college basketball team wins or loses. You ever met those people? Yeah? 
I mean, I grew up, I'm a UK fan. I, I, I live in southeastern Indiana. We had a UK mailbox. About once a year, it would get destroyed. Somebody would like drive through it. And my grandpa would go back out and, and pick that stupid thing right back up again, right? But, but you know, those, those, those hardcore fans that put their college team above all. And when they lose, their world is torn up, Right? Do, do you guys know any of those people? Any of the people? You know who I'm talking about? They, they, they have succe- they've successfully allowed this group of like 22-year-old kids to dictate their demeanor, their mood, and the well-being of their life on whether they've won or lost a basketball game. Now, if you step back and think about that for a second, that's a little sad, isn't it? I mean, they've missed the, the big picture. Of it all, because I love watching basketball, especially UK basketball, because they're winners. Um, <laughs> hey, they have the best players money can buy. I mean, let's, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I mean, they've got more for, going for them than a college that just has books written by strippers right for him so <laughs> um so <laughs> um uh, they they've missed the, they, but they've missed the big picture here because i i love i love college basketball i love watching college football i i, I enjoy it I enjoy the freedom and the the margin to be entertained by a, a great sport and sporting event i enjoy that right uh, the byproduct of a, of a structured group of people who, who have started this, this sport and have sanctioned it, and now they maintain a college sport league. I think that's a great thing. They've worked together to do this, and I get to benefit from it. The moments with friends, right? And then whenever you've got the, the, the crazy ones who, who are just super ridiculous about their sports, the stupid stuff they say during those sporting events, I find entertaining. It's sad on the back end of it, right? And so we miss the big picture because we're so worried about the winning, the winning and the losing that we allow it to, to dictate our life. And all of that is lost because of, of, of worship, right? Worship dependent on a sporting team that, especially if you're U of L, is going to let you down. Ultimately, right? We put our trust and our effort into something. Um, so that was, I digress. Let's get back to Nevi. All right. So, so he does this idol thing. And there are a few guys that don't buy it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, they don't bow. And the little nerds that do the astrology stuff for Nebuchadnezzar, they, they go and they tattle on him, right? They tattle on these guys. And, and, and I believe that they didn't bow because they were able to see the bigger picture. All right? They, 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 didn't, they didn't get wrapped up in the idol or the idols because as I, as I kind of processed this, I realized that there were two idols here, right? Those idols were, one, the winner, or two, the fear of what the winner would do if they didn't bow right? So safety and comfort was an idol too. And so, and so they were wrapped up in, 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 in this, they, they saw the bigger picture and they weren't wrapped up in the worship of these idols. What they were wrapped up in though, and I want you to hear this, as we step into like this election season, is that, that God, he doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste a moment He doesn't waste a trial. He doesn't waste a victory. He doesn't waste a defeat. That's what they were wrapped up in. A God who doesn't waste anything. He makes good out of it because God doesn't, he doesn't waste anything. If it's good, we get to celebrate it, right? And if it it hurts, he uses it for refinement. And that's good. And we get to celebrate good. So either way, be it, a quick win or the long way around, we get to celebrate. Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who God is and what he has done, is doing, and will do. All right? 
And so when we, can, when we can buy into something that's bigger than just the wind, then we don't have to worship the wings. Right? We don't have to, we don't have to worship the left side or the right side because God's bigger than both of those, even combined. Which leads me to the second thing. All right? I want to ask you a question. Who are you? Like, who are you? Like, when I ask you that, what kind of pops into your mind? Who are you? How do you define yourself? Like, what do you lead with? I mean, norm normally I, I lead with apologizing for uh, my muffin top, right? I'm just kidding. That doesn't define me. Just this accentuates all of this, right? Anyways, but who are you? Like, my Instagram profile says I'm a, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I'm a drummer. I'm a Diz nerd, which Microsoft Word tried to spell check for me. Um, and a visioneer for world change. Like, like, if I had to wrap it up in one sentence, that's who I feel that I am through 41 years of, of, of processing, right? In other words, I am, I'm like a fine tiramisu. There's layers to all this, right? There's layers to this, player. Or maybe like an onion, there's layers to that too. <laughs> or an ogre. But I prefer tiramisu because I'm sweet. Anyways, but anyways, I, I, I can't be defined by, by either one of of those statements totally on their own, right? Except for maybe the Christ follower one. But listen to this. I also believe that the things that follow that statement, that I'm a Christ follower, allow people a deeper glimpse of what kind of Christ follower I am. Because our world is so polarized that, that a lot of people just assume that if, you, if you're a Christian, you're also a jerk, and I believe that it's spiritually impossible to be a Christian and a jerk at the same time. So which one are you? Right? So none of those. Dad, that does not totally and completely define who I am. Husband does not totally and completely define who I am. Diz nerd is probably the closest thing, right? No, but none of those on their own define who I am. There's layers to that. There are, are complexities that can only be understood through conversation and experience with me, right? I'm defined by several things, not by one. There's not one thing other than follower of Christ that can completely define me. And even in that, the things that follow better define me. So, so if, the, if the sum and total of your identity hinges on whether you are a Republican or a Democrat by itself, you've already sold yourself short. You've already cheapened who you are. That should not be the sum and total of who you are. T take a look at this passage in the book of Psalms. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. That sounds pretty complex to me. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your, your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. They cannot be easily defined, right? I can't, I can't even count them. They, they outnumber the grains of sand, and when I wake up, you are still with me. Like, that sounds like God created something more complex than can be defined by a political party or any just one thing. All right. So when God was was weaving me together, my innermost parts, when I'm when I'm baking in the oven for nine months, right? These 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 complexities 
these plans and, 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 and hopes that God created me for had so many more facets than whether I was going to be a Democrat or a Republican. He, he, he probably thought about what kind of husband I would be, yeah, or father or, or friend or communicator. And, 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 and I'm sure that he had a red or a blue stamp. And, and before he sealed the deal, he stamped me with one or the other and said, this is what is going to define you, right? And I'm also sure that he, he's white and an American too, right? Drives a Dodge pickup and wears camouflage, Drinks PBR, right? But, but, but from what I've read and understood, God was interested in the kind of human that I would be. Not really the political party that I would identify with. And, and, and I understand, I understand the pushback. All right, well, Tim, doesn't the party that you back basically tell us what kind of person you are? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. The big thing is, though, if we allow the party to be responsible for defining what kind of person we are, are we even our own person anymore? If the party gets to define it and you don't get to define it, then you are not yours, right? So that's why I say think purple instead of red or blue, because that's somewhere in the middle, right? Whenever you mix red and blue, you get purple, right? Some of you had started back to school this week. Um, this, allows the, the, this allows you as an individual to unpack, to, to sift through, and establish what kind of person you are. All right? The party shouldn't get the power to define you. You actually have the power to define the party in your own mind, in your own heart. So you make those calls. They don't make those calls. And if you're actually putting in the work, you, you'll more than likely be various shades of purple. And you will know on a deeper level the reason for those shades of purple. Some might be a little more blue than red, and some might be a little more red than blue. But there are going to be various shades of purple. I believe in my heart of hearts that, that, that there are no 100% reds and no 100% blues who actually take the responsibilities as a citizen and an individual seriously. I don't think that, that, that they have shaping the world and the collective at heart. And when you do run into true blues and true reds, get ready for a fight. Like get ready for a fight, which makes me wonder why they even call them parties in the first place, right? Our party's <laughs> supposed to be fun. It kind of, it kind of sucks that they stole the word party, right? <laughs> parties are supposed to be fun. I think we're misusing it kind of like we do love. Like I love my wife. I also love tacos, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm misusing that word for one of those. I don't know which one, right? So it's just weird to me that they use the word party because that, that just ain't right. But, but imagine, imagine, listen, imagine if we could have a bunch of conversations that discuss these, these various shades of purple. Not 100% red, not 100% blue, but various shades of purple, which leads me to my next point. My final point, um, converse cordially, right? Or converse cordially, right? Which makes me hungry for cordial cherries, not shoes. I don't eat shoes. I love shoes, but I don't eat shoes. I love tacos and my wife too, though. Anyways, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sick of the finger pointing, Right? Is anybody else sick of that? I'm sick of the finger pointing. I'm sick of the mud slinging. I'm sick of the blame game. Could you imagine the progress that could be made if we just took the time that is spent scheming and conniving and we put that toward actual progress? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine what this world would look like? I, I, I want to jump into this passage really quick. It's a guy named Paul. He was in a big city. Um, called Athens, or if you're from the South, Athens. Um, this, this place, listen, Athens was hopping. It was a big city. It's like New York or L.A. 
or DC or, or like Madison, Indiana type hopping, all right? <laughs> this place, this place, it was the place to be. It was a place to see people and to be seen, all right? And, and, and this dude, Paul, he's on a mission. He's on a mission to save the world. The only reason he is anywhere at any time is to preach the gospel. Like that is his purpose. Like he's intense about it. And that was his life's mission. But if, if, if you look at who he was as an individual, you see some pretty special stuff in this passage. We're in Acts chapter 17. It says, now, now while Paul is, is waiting for them, other disciples, other followers, right? At Athens, um, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that, that the city was full of idols. The city was full of these things that were created by, by people to declare their win. And people were worshiping them, leaving offerings to them, doing some other crazy stuff in the name of these, in the name of these idols. And now, while well, Paul was waiting for them in Athens, oh wait, so he reasoned in the synagogue, now, stop for just a second. What did he do in the synagogue? He reasoned. Oh, he didn't argue. He didn't yell. He didn't point fingers. He didn't sling mud. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, the very people that killed Jesus, his Lord and Savior, and the devout persons, and, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So not just churchy people, but also just people. Just people people, right? Right? And so he reasoned and he hung out in the, in the marketplace and some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, conversed with him. Um, so, the, so the Epicurean and the Stoics were at this point in time kind of like your Republicans and Democrats. Like the Epicureans were kind of like, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Like, let, let's just make the world awesome, right? And then you had, you had the, the Stoics who were kind of like, but this is the way we've always done it, right? And so they were philosophizing on both sides of that. And, and this, is what, this is what Paul did with both sides. He got in the middle and he conversed with them. He didn't yell at them, didn't preach at them didn't point fingers, didn't sling mud. He conversed with them. And, and through this, some said, what, what, what's this guy talking about? Like, what's he babbling about? Like, is, is he smoking crack? Like, he's, he's just talking out of his head, right? Others said, he, but he, seem, he seems to be preaching, like, about these foreign divinities, because, because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. Why? Because that's his purpose. That's his point. And they, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus, um, which is like this big open air, almost like a stadium, if you will. And, and all the bigwigs hung out there saying, um, may we know more about this new teaching and that you are presenting for, for you bring some strange things to our ears. Like through this conversation, you've opened our minds to things that we've not even thought about that couldn't be thought about, that couldn't be brought to the table because we're screaming over top of one another, okay? We wish to know, therefore, uh, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they'd spend their time in nothing but kind of telling stories and talking about uh, things that are new, right? Right? And I absolutely love this passage. I say this about a lot of passages, but I really mean this. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. One of my absolute favorite stories in the Bible. It proves that we can exist alongside people that don't agree with us 100% and still be cool with one another. This story goes on to talk about how he quotes their poets. It'd be almost like him quoting Kanye or something, you know, to the Athenians like using their culture to be able to speak with them on a level that's, that's going to introduce new things into their life. And, and there are a few things that were going on here. The main one is, listen, he had a mission. What was his mission? Ain't none of y'all listen to me. His mission was just, just to preach the gospel, right? He had a mission. He's accomplishing his mission still in a way that is not combative. 
He's accomplishing his mission in the midst of a conversation. As a matter of fact, it's what allows him to accomplish his mission. This means he's probably listened to people as well as talked at people or to people, right? And when I say listen, I don't, mean for the, I don't mean for the sake of a rebuttal, but for the sake of understanding. He's listened to these people, and ultimately what happens, what happens is that these, these conversations, they lead to more conversation, which leads to more conversation, right? Arguments, well, they're won and lost and walked away from. Conversations continue to build on one another. Do you see what the Apostle Paul is doing here? Do you see what he's doing in, in, in this hot spot in the world? In this place to be in the world that is both progressive and traditional. That is why he could hang with both the Epicureans and the Stoics. That's why he could chill with the, with the philosophers. That's why he could reason at the synagogue, right? That's why he found himself in front of the high council in the Areopagus. Because he could converse without being a jerk, right? He knew what he believed about Jesus. He knew it. Like you weren't going to rip that away from him. He knew that. But he also knew what he believed about people. And he loved them and that they weren't enemies. They were people searching for a life that meant something more than just bowing down to an idol. An idol that ultimately 4,000 years later would just be a part of the earth again. The very dirt that Nebuchadnezzar had them stick their faces in is now what that idol is a part of. Is that a win? That doesn't seem like a win to me. Ultimately, in the long run, that is a loss. So I challenge you, church, think purple. Think various shades of purple. If you are convinced that your party has all the answers, listen up. If you are convinced that your party has all the answers, you are mistaken. And you're bowing down to an idol that just wants to win. When we begin to explore those shades of purple, we begin to find out that God, that, that, that what God was up to when he was weaving us together in our mother's womb, it refines us. It allows us to become the us that only we could be. It allows you to become the, the Quentin that only Quentin can be, right? It allows you to become the Aaron that only Aaron can be. And, and you become more and more that as, as you are refined by God. But that is not found in the red or the blue. It's found in those various shades of purple because now all of a sudden, you know who you are regardless of what they say you are, right? And as we, as we have these cordial conversations, we understand that, that better and better who we are, right? And so as we think in these shades of purple, we find out who it is we are. And then when we find out who we are, we find out what we're able to be inside of this society. Sometimes in spite of the society. Or maybe for the society. Right? And so, so I, I urge you, don't just take one extreme or the other and let them make you bow down. Think, think shades of purple. And then you get to be you. You get to keep you in the midst of all this. Even if everything else falls apart, you get to keep you because your identity is in who God is, not in what some group of e e extreme liberals or conservatives say that you are. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that, that you created us so complex that we cannot be defined by a political party. That you also created us with, with an intention of being the people that we need to be in this world. And that actually puts us in the place of power to define what is right and what is not right. To, to deduce from what's going on around us and find out where we need to be. And, and Lord, we thank you for those various shades of purple that we, that we can converse around, to have these conversations that build on one another, 
that aren't just fights that come to a, an explosive end and that we just walk away from. Lord, we thank you for giving us a language, giving us a, a, an intellect to be able to converse with one another and build upon these conversations as the church, Lord, help us to be that. We thank you for your son who died for us, who gave us the freedom to even have these conversations. And we thank you for the hope that you give us, that regardless of what happens in November, regardless of what happens with COVID, regardless of what happens with, with humanity, that you win and it's going to be all right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and stand. of the son of man stories of a savior holiness with human hands treasure for the traitor no ear had heard no eye had seen
Amen. All right, you guys have a great week.